Welcome to worship this evening. Good to have you here, those visiting with us. We welcome you too to this evening worship service at Bethel. Uh, it's good to be able to do this again. If you catch me reading with one eye, it's because sometimes I have to, uh, and I am. But uh, it's, it's, it's getting better, and it's, uh, we're thankful for that. Let's begin with a, with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, it's, it's right and pleasant for us to come into your presence again this evening, for we know that our hope and our peace, our joy, our salvation, all rests in you, in your work for us, in and through Jesus Christ. It's good for us to bring our praise, for we know there's no one el nowhere else to bring our praise and our thankfulness than to you. And so it's good for us to be here, to set this time aside to come into your presence to worship. So bless our time together. Be with us by your Spirit. Fill us with your Spirit. And may your Word speak to us and the, the songs we sing uh, refresh and encourage us. And the prayers we bring come before your throne. Hear our prayer. Receive our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for a call to worship. From Psalm 116, I love the Lord, for He heard my voice, He heard my cry for mercy. Because He turned His ear to me, I will call on Him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me, the anguish of the grave came upon me, I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord, O Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord protects the simple-hearted. When I was in great need, He saved me. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. God Himself is with us. Let us now adore Him. Three stanzas, number 244 in our grace altar. It'll be on the screen as well. Let's sing together these words.
Yes, this is the God who is with us. By His Word, by His Spirit. Receive His greeting, grace, be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and presence of His Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's now turn and welcome each other to this place and time of worship. Hi, Dawn. Oh, no, oh, I thought Dawn was just here. She <laughs> was. You may be seated. I'd like to read Psalm 2 for a psalm of praise. And then we want to respond by singing the words of that psalm. Wherefore do the nations rage from number 2 in the grace altar? And immediately after that we we'll sing uh, the, two, the, the verses of our, our, the stanza of God, Our God Reigns from 195 in the grace altar. But first of all, the words of Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord, against His anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you be destroyed in your way, for His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Psalm 2. Let's sing the words of that psalm now.
I would invite you to turn on your Bibles, if you wish, to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. It will be on the screen also. We want to read the entire chapter, but the last four verses, actually the last three verses, will be our text, verses 14 through 16, Jesus the great high priest. Before we read the word, let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, this is your word. This is your message to people who had a hard time accepting and believing and continuing to trust the superior, finished work of Jesus Christ. They had to hear that He now sits on the throne and what it meant for them that He sits on that throne, that He is Lord of all. May it benefit us. Give us peace. Give us hope. Help us to know and to understand where our prayers go when we bring them to the throne. Bless our time together with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4. The author writes, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on, my, on oath in my anger they will never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, and on the seventh day God rested from his work. And again in the passage above he says, They shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was said before, Today if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also enters a rest from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing, to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. And here's our text. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our, hour, in our time of need. May God bless the, hearing, the, the reading and hearing of His Word. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, about a week, week and a half ago, the weatherman called for heavy rain showers, possible uh, flash flooding in Pipestone County. And we heard it and we picked up our ears. That's where we were born. That's where we were raised, Pipestone County, Minnesota. We wondered, what happened? How much rain did they get? Did it affect the crops? What, what creeks overflowed? What about our relatives who lived there? Did, did they suffer any consequences of the flooding? You see, we know that place. We know what it looks like. We can picture it in our minds. Can you and I imagine 
that when the news of our lives by way of prayer reaches the throne at the center of the universe, that someone there on that throne picks up his ears and says, I've been there. I can picture the struggle. I know what they're going through. The news that comes to the throne of the universe is the news that our loved one passed away. And death has broken up our home and our marriage and our family and the house is quiet and empty. The news that has reached the throne at the center of the universe is the news that our body is wearing out. <laughs> Sight isn't what it ought to be. Hearing isn't what it ought to be. Limbs are beginning to get weaker. The doctor hinted at cancer, diabetes. The cry that reaches the throne is the cry of parents whose kids are going through temptations and they seem unable to resist. The news that reaches heaven is that we're going, we're fighting a habit and the habit keeps winning. We seem to be out of resources on our own. We have let the throne of the universe hear that perhaps we're lonely. We're discouraged with pain, the frustrations of life, the dreams that we had are broken, the busyness of life. We have no one to confide in. Maybe beaten down, discouraged, defeated. The utterly amazing thing, the unbelievable thing, is that when this news reaches the throne of the universe, someone there says, I've been there. I used to live there. I know what earth looks like. I know what life in a sinful world is like. I'm well aware of the power and the lure of temptations that my people face. I know the pain of death. I know the deceitful power of the evil one. And then, when this news of our lives reaches the throne, Occupied by the one who lives there, that throne in the universe becomes a throne of grace. The letter to these Hebrews informs us about Ascension's establishment of a throne of grace. Ascension Day kind of slips by us, you know, without paying too much attention to it on that Thursday, 40 days after Easter. It just kind of comes and goes. But, you know, it's a day that has implications for our lives always. The Ascension's establishment of a throne of grace. The purpose of this author writing this letter to Hebrews is to prove that Jesus Christ is superior, superior to angels, superior to Old Testament prophets, superior to Old Testament priests. The sacrifice he made was superior to the sacrifice that the priests make, animal sacrifices. He's writing to a people who were, it seems, wanting to avoid some of the hassles of persecution that Christians received by going back, going back to the old covenant ceremonies and sacrifices. But as he writes about Jesus Christ and the superiority of Jesus, the author does so also against a background of, of common prevalent ideas about how, how much and how God is involved in people's lives. The Jews had a hard time fixing in their mind the idea that God would actually die for them, that God would send His Son. This God, was, this God was holy. He was totally separated from sinners. The only way we can, we can relate to this God is by keeping the law, every part of the law. The more law, the better. Some folks still believe that about God, you know. I've, I've tried to be good, but then i got this problem in my life. What more can I do? God must be angry with me. At the same time, the Greeks who might have been in the audience of, of, of those who received this letter had the idea of a God who was far off and, and distant and detached from earth and its troubles. 
The Greek God was not so much holy as he was a God who didn't really care what happened to people on earth, to men and women and children. He was having his own fun romping on Mount Olympus. Too much fun to, be cared, to, to really care for people. And some folks still think of God that way in their darkest hours. God was so busy running the big events of life, he's forgotten all about me. To these two groups of people with their ideas of God, a holy God, and also a detached God, the author of Hebrews describes the ascension this way. You know what? We have a great high priest. A great high priest who has gone through the heavens. Now when he says gone through the heavens, we may, pick, we may imagine that he's picturing heaven as a kind of a three-tiered or more tiered layers, you know. Paul, Paul, Paul the Apostle said that he had this vision once, once about reaching the third heaven. Perhaps, I don't, we don't know. But anyway, the, the, the point the, ascension, the, the author wants to make is that the great high priest ascended into heaven. A cloud hid him from their sight while the apostles were watching, and he descended into heaven. He entered heaven. Now the point which the author wants to make is this. Who was it who entered heaven? How must we now see the one who has gone into heaven, detached from us, caring only for the big things of life? How may we now look at the throne upon which that ascended one sat down? He's not a holy, separated God, not a detached, disinterested God, but a great high priest. The God who ascended into heaven is the God who stood between the Father God, the Creator, and His sinful creatures living on earth. And he stood between them, cre creator and creature, in a, in, in a very unique way. He was, he is, God-man. He is God wearing human flesh. He joined the holy creator and sinful man in his very person. And then he made a sacrifice as that priest for the sins of the creature. A sacrifice that satisfied the creator. A sacrifice that atoned for our sins. But it was a very unique sacrifice. It was not a sacrifice he brought, that he carried. It was a sacrifice of himself. He, the great high priest, is great because he made the sacrifice. He was the lamb without blemish. Now this idea was an offense to many Jews. It was a scandal to the Greeks. They had no room for a God who would die for men, no room for a God who make a, would make a sacrifice for, for the sins of men, no, no, no room for a God who was at all interested in how things went with us in life. But here he is, says the author of Hebrews, the great high priest, the God-man, the lamb of sacrifice, who died, has risen, and has entered heaven. Which means, he said, we have a God in heaven who once lived here. He is now wearing our flesh in heaven. He once wore that flesh on earth. While here, he got to know this place. He was tempted in every way like we are. He got to know what it was like to living, living in a sinful, sin-damaged creation. He knew what it was like to be tempted by the evil one. He knew how powerful the devil's temptations could be, how alluring, how fun they sounded, how prosperous we might be if we followed him. He knew what pain was. He knew what death was. He knew what the inside of a grave looked like. He knew what it was like to be rejected by people, by men, despised, scorned, mocked. But he was always able to resist the temptations of the, of the devil. He went through life on earth in perfect obedience to his Father. And now that he has ascended, now that he has moved from earth to heaven, now that he is sitting on the throne of the universe, 
We can be sure, says the author of Hebrews, that this great high priest has not forgotten where he came from, where he lived for a time, where he tented among us for a time. Our prayers reach the throne like news from home, like reports from where he has been. Our prayers, or rather the Holy Spirit brings our prayers to that throne and the one of the throne can identify where they came from. I once lived there. For 33 years, that was my home. I know what life is like. I know the power of the temptation. I know the power of the evil one. I know what pain is. I know what death is. I wept, too, at the grave of my friend Lazarus. I felt whips. I felt the humiliation of somebody else's spit running down my face. Talk about the ultimate in bullying. All of which, therefore, his death, his resurrection, all of this, his ascension, all of this allows the throne at the center of the universe to be for us a throne of grace, a very approachable a throne of grace. A throne of grace we can approach with confidence, he said, not with fear, with confidence. At the place of highest rule, at the place where the Creator rules His creation, in the control room of the coming kingdom, there is a throne. And because the one who ascended sits on that throne, that throne becomes a throne of grace. A throne from which grace flows, daily grace, sufficient grace, Grace to help us in our time of need. So really, no matter our situation, no matter our temptations, no matter our weaknesses, no matter our pain, no matter how foolish we have been, the occupant on the throne perks up his ears at every prayer of his people. And he says, I've been there. I've been tempted. I've gone through that. And then he promises help, timely help timely grace, timely strength for our hour of need. And so now we have an explanation, people of God, as to why believers who have lost loved ones find the grace to bear up and face each day with courage and even are able to be a blessing to other folks. The prayers that went to the throne in the hour of need went to a throne of timely grace. The one sitting there says, I went through that. I know what death is. I know what loneliness is. From that throne comes grace to help in time of need. Now we know why believers can testify to receiving power to overcome a temptation to overcome a, a, a nasty habit, to overcome a fascination that is detracting them. Their prayers went to a throne that has become the throne of grace from the one sitting there. Now we know why people can, can, can explain how, life, how their life was turned around. As Pastor John told us the story this morning, how things happen in people's lives where, where from the depth they find hope and life and freedom and peace. Now we know where the grace of forgiveness comes from when we sin and humbly ask to be forgiven. It comes from the one who was tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin, and then paid the price, made a sufficient sacrifice for all of us. He is willing and able now to show us, extend to us the grace of forgiveness. One final word from the author of Hebrews, because of all of this, the great high priest dying, rising, ascending to heaven, and establishing a throne at the center of the universe as a throne of grace, be sure, be sure, he said, to hold on to the faith that we profess. Hold confidently to that faith that the throne where Jesus now is is a throne of grace for timely help in our hour of need. Hold firmly the trust that it's the great high priest 
who made a sacrifice for us, who now sits on that throne. Be, can, be confident that every prayer to the one on the throne will be recognized as coming from one who knows what we go through, who lived among us. And every prayer is voiced by people who are battling what he once battled when he lived and walked among us. The people of God, as I suggested earlier, we benefit greatly from the ascension of Jesus, not one day a week, or in a, rather one day in a year, but we benefit every day because that ascension established a throne in heaven, a throne of grace. Don't be afraid, nor be ashamed to ever approach that throne now that you and I know who sits there. Every call to him will come from people he gave his life for. Every call, every prayer comes from him who knows what it's like to live where we live. Let nothing shake this confidence, this trust. Come often to that throne, now that we know who sits there. And now we know what that throne has become because he sits there. The throne of grace for timely need, not timely help in our hours of need. Amen. Thank you, Father, for that revelation, just from your word. At the throne, at the center of the universe, has become a throne of grace for your people. Father, we pray that none of us may get the wrong picture of who you are and who sits on that throne, a detached God, a, a disinterested God, a God con concerned with only, only with the big things of life. Help us to know that every prayer reaches that throne and timely help in our hours of need is given to us. Help us all to keep the faith, to keep the faith we profess in the powerful, finished work of Jesus Christ. Hear our prayer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Sing to Jesus. His the scepter. His the throne. Let's sing those three stanzas together. We've been asked to uh, have to remember one prayer concern. Pastor John got this just before he came, and that is that uh, Marianne Bleeker 
uh, sent him a message that her nephew, Isaac Chase, uh, passed away quite suddenly, heart, heart failure. And we know no more, no more details in terms of age or, or, or where they lived or anything. Maybe some of you folks do. Uh, then that can be included in your prayers. But we want to remember that family and their extended family too in prayer. Let's come to God in prayer. Father, we know that in these hours of need and loss and death and pain, the pain of loss, that prayers go to your throne. They reach your throne of grace. And so, Father, as we've heard this message from Marianne, we pray that you will hear the prayers of her family, their extended family, the parents of this young, this young man, this nephew, that you will comfort them, that from the throne of grace there may come grace to help in this time of need. Comfort them with the truth of the gospel, the gospel held out, held out for us in Jesus Christ, that our sins have been paid for, and the hope of eternal life is ours. So, Father, comfort this family in your grace. And, Father, we, we pray that you will continue to hear the prayers of your people in their hours of loneliness, in their loss, in their times of pain, as they deal with healing and the slowness of healing, as folks deal with heart difficulties and healing from surgeries, as the list was laid out for us this morning, we pray that you will continue to bless and care for all these folks who are mentioned, that you will provide for them in your grace and in your mercy, that healing may continue to happen in their bodies and in their lives. And if not healing, then certainly the grace of patience, the grace of, of faith that they belong to you. Father, we pray in all the situations of our lives, we pray that we may take the admonishment of the author of Hebrews to heart, that we keep the faith, that we recognize there's a day of rest coming and it comes to those who believe the gospel, who combine the hearing of the gospel with faith, genuine faith in the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray for your blessing on all of us, on all of those who struggle, on the aged among us, on those who recognize that their life is slowly, in one way or another, ebbing away. We pray, Father, for much grace in their lives. For all the elderly among us, give them peace, give them hope, help them, to, that, help them that their faith stays strong. Father, we thank you for your many blessings that you give us. We look back at the, at the past week and there were blessings of rain, but blessings of sunshine and blessings of warmth that the crops needed. And we thank you that we can look around us and see lush green in the fields, in the lawns. And we pray that you'll continue to provide what the crops need so that there may be a harvest down the road. And we pray for the folks who have experienced too much in, a, in, a, in our estimation and in their estimation, maybe too much water in, in the south and they're dealing with floods and flash floods. We pray, Father, that you will bless them too and that they may recognize that in the struggles of life there is opportunity to turn to the one in whom we have hope, living hope. We may turn to the one who... Grace to us gives us a reason for living that's even bigger than big crops or a, a gentle, prosperous life. So, Father, we pray that the gospel may take root and may be heard by folks going through difficult times in their lives. Father, we pray for your world. We pray for peace in your world. We pray for... The, we pray for uh, your, your power and grace to be extended into the Middle East where there's struggle with violent people taking lives and beheading others and causing pain and hardship. 
persecuting believers, persecuting, persecuting Christians or those who are not of their same mind. Father, bring wise leadership to the fore in these places that they may recognize the need to, to deal with this problem and to deal with it wisely and justly. Bring peace to parts of Africa also where there's still struggles between religious groups. We pray, Father, there, there too that peace may be found, that you will frustrate the purpose of those who would, who would do evil, who would do violence in, in, in your creation. We pray, Father, for the power of the gospel to go forth in our own country, around the world. We pray, Father, that you will bless the missionaries who represent us, who go far off from us and work in, in the Ukraine and Nicaragua, Costa Rica, other parts of, in parts of Africa, Spain. Bless their work. Encourage them. Bless the work of mercy around the world. Bless the work of farmer to farmer. We pray, Father, that lives may be touched and the lives of people may be, in, 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 may be enriched through the work of, of believers working with folks in, the, in their own country. And we pray that the cause of Christ may become more credible and the gospel of Jesus Christ more real as people recognize the, the, the work of Christians among them. Bless the work of world renew then around the world. Bless all our missionaries, wherever they go, who represent us as a denomination. We pray, Father, that you will bless the work of Synod again. We ask that you will bless the delegates, that they may make good decisions, wise decisions that serve the coming of your kingdom, serve the cause of Christ. And we pray that you will bless and bring all of them home to their work again, uh, in, to their homes in safety. Go with us then, we pray, in the week that is ahead. Give us strength for the work and the tasks. Help us to see clearly what you want us to do and to, to do it faithfully. Bless the work of our hands. Prosper it, we pray. We ask you to bless our giving, our giving of gifts for the uh, Family Crisis Center. We pray that you will bless their ministry too to folks who are experiencing abuse, wives, children. We ask, Father, that ministry may take place and lives may be improved and folks may be helped. Multiply these gifts. So hear our prayer. Receive our worship. May it be to the name and the glory and honor of your name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offering is for the Family Crisis Center. Let's present our, to God the gifts that we have brought.
Let's stand and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. The author of Hebrews encouraged us to hang on to our faith, to keep the faith. And this is the faith we keep. We say together these words, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Crown him with many crowns. The last song we want to sing, the three stanzas. We'll receive the benediction and then sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.